you for attending Marine Science Day. We're excited to have attendees from all over the world with us today. My name is Jason Pafford, and I will be your host for this session. In this session, Jamison Gregg, a marine scientist at VIMS, and Josh McGilley, a graduate student at Old Dominion University, will be sharing their research on mycobacteriosis and striped bass. After a short presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which Josh will answer your questions on this topic. And now I'll turn it over to Josh to get us started. So good morning, everyone. I would like to thank you all for um, tuning in this morning to our presentation, uh, Disease in Striped Bass, Understanding Mycobacteriosis. Uh, my name is Joshua McGilley. I'm a current graduate student at Old Dominion University. With me today is Jameson Gregg from VIMS. Uh, my project is a collaborative project between myself, uh, my main advisor, and a survey team up at VIMS. So to start off today, I'm gonna to go over a little bit of biology about striped bass. So striped bass are an anadromous species, meaning they spend most of their lives in salt water and migrate to fresh water to spawn. Their historical range is along the Atlantic coast from the St. Lawrence River in Canada, down to the St. John's River in Florida, and then in the Gulf of um, Mexico, from the Suwannee River in Florida to Corpus Christi Bay in Texas. They have also been successfully introduced to the West Coast in the 1890s and to plenty of reservoirs, lakes, and rivers found throughout North America. And regionally in Virginia, striped bass are one of the most important fin fish species within the bay's ecosystem. Um, there are three main spawning sites located along the Atlantic coast, the Chesapeake Bay, which is comprised of a number of different tributaries that flow into the bay, the Delaware River, and the Hudson River. Small localized spawning does also occur along the entire Atlantic coast. Males reach sexual maturity at an earlier age than females do at around two to three years, while females reach it between five and seven. And striped bass um, before or up to the age of one year old, they tend not to uh, leave their natal rivers, so the rivers that they were born into. As they grow older, they begin extending their range into neighboring further estuaries and then into the oceans. So to explain the migrational patterns of striped bass, I'm gonna use this map on the right. So the three main spawning areas are blocked out in Chesapeake Bay, um, Delaware River, and Hudson River. After spawning in mid spring and then into summer, striped bass begin entering the oceans and moving north along the coast depicted by the green and yellow arrows. Um, in fall, once temperatures begin lowering, um, they turn around, start heading south along the coast as winter approaches and then winter arrives. Uh, a large portion of striped bass do winter in the Atlantic Ocean between Southern New Jersey and then North Carolina. But there are a number of fish that do overwinter in um, bays, estuaries and rivers throughout the entire coast. And then once early spring does arrive, um, the sexually mature fish do begin leaving their wintering areas and then moving into the spawning rivers um, and the cycle begins again. So what is mycobacteriosis, this big strange word? So mycobacteriosis is a disease caused by several species of bacteria in the genus Mycobacterium. Um, it is a common disease affecting fin fish and is likely that most fish are susceptible to becoming infected. And there are a number of fin fish species that can become infected by several different mycobacteria species. So it's not a case where um, one fin fish species is only impacted by one mycobacteria species. <clears throat> and high disease prevalence has been reported in aquaculture populations, but it's not usually seen in high prevalence in wild fin fish stocks, but that's going to come into play a little bit later in the presentation. So transmission of mycobacteria is still poorly understood, um, but it does likely involve ingestion of bacteria um, from contaminated food and or being exposed to bacteria through the water column. Um, once a fish does become infected, bacteria is identified by the fish's immune system. Mycobacteria, they are very resilient bacteria. So they can actually reproduce within the white blood cells, also known as macrophages that are intended to kill them sent by the immune system. In response, the immune system does a backup plan where they pretty much wall off the bacteria within um, the fish's tissue with aggregations of the same kind of white blood cells. And these are known as granulomas. They can usually be found in the fish's spleen or also the head kidney. Along with the internal granulomas, fish can exhibit sores on their skin so they can range in size and location on the fish's body. 
from uh, small pigmented scale erosions, also known as pigmented foci, to small or large hemorrhaging ulcers. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that a fish, in this case striped bass, can have internal granulomas, but not have external disease present. But a fish cannot have external disease present, likely without having interne internal granulomas present. This picture right here shows a striped bass with a rather, rather large hemorrhaged ulcer underneath its pectoral fin. The um, black arrow is pointing to it. But also behind the black arrow on the fish's belly, you can see small red and black dots. So those are likely a mixture of um, smaller ulcers or also those pigmented foci found along the entire fish's stomach. And then this picture right here shows a um, section of a striped bass's spleen. Um, this fish was categorized as severely diseased with many granulomas found throughout this very small section of spleen. So the structure of a granuloma um, inside towards the middle of the granuloma consists of the core, which has necrotic tissue and bacteria present. And then around the core of the granuloma is those aggregations of white blood cells. So the red arrow to the top of the picture, um, it is pointing towards those aggregations of white blood cells that are surrounding the core of the granuloma. And then in the middle of the picture, the blue arrow is pointed towards the core of that particular granuloma. <clears throat> so now kind of putting these two ideas together, mycobacteriosis and striped bass. Mycobacteriosis has severely affected wild striped bass populations with outbreaks documented in both West and East Coast populations. Infection was first documented along the East Coast in 1997 with Chesapeake Bay striped bass, beginning to show signs of emaciation and the presence of the skin lesions. Mycobacterium shotsii and pseudoshotsii were isolated and identified from striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay during the early 2000s. These are the two main um, mycobacteria species we now find in Chesapeake Bay striped bass, along with several other species. And the original documented case and then the isolation of these two species were actually done at BIMS. Sadly, once a fish does become infected, it turns into a chronic infection um, with very little evidence of it ever regressing in severity. Fish usually stay at the same severity they are or they progress further into a more severe state. So there are two main um, studies that I'm gonna discuss, both done at VIMS, the looked at mycobacteriosis prevalence in the Chesapeake Bay. So the first was a previous survey at VIMS in the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay. So in the main portion of the bay between 2003 and five, demonstrated greater than a 70% um, internal disease prevalence. So the presence of granulomas in fish tissue in some ages of striped bass. So very high prevalence was reported um, as age increased. Modeling of these data supported the presence of disease-associated mortality with annual survival chances of diseased fish estimated to be 69% of non-diseased fish. And then in a separate study, fish in the Rappahannock River were, or were examined for skin lesions as a part of a tag recapture study between 2005 and 12. And what this study found was presence of skin lesions were associated with de decreased survival. So what these two studies looked at was mycobacteriosis in two different ways in Chesapeake Bay striped bass. The first study looked at the internal disease while the second study looked at external disease. And they came to the same conclusion um, that fish that were diseased had a lower annual survival chance compared to non-diseased fish. And then the second study, it looked at the skin lesions. It broke it into um, three separate severity categories mild, moderate, and severe. It showed that as um, disease increased in severity, relative survival of the fish did decrease. So now getting into my own current work. Um, so my master's research involves determining mycobacteriosis prevalence for three of the Chesapeake Bay spawning tributaries, the James, Rappahannock, and Mattapanai River. Um, this work is done in partners with um, VIMS during their long um, running tagging monitoring program for striped bass, which samples populations from February to May of each year. Fish are caught using electrofishing in all rivers, while gillnets are exclusively used in the James and Rappahannock rivers. 
And due to previous overfishing and mismanagement of the striped bass population, Virginia and other coastal states are required to monitor their striped bass stocks. That is the purpose of um, this survey that I am entitled to collect my data through. So VIMS monitors size, age comparison, sex ratio, and maturity, specifically on the spawning grounds of Chesapeake Bay tributaries, where large numbers of striped bass would congregate. So to explain the gill net process a little bit more, um, James and Rappahannock River both have two 300 foot long gill nets fished approximately a quarter mile away from each other for a 24 hour period during the surveying season. At the bottom of the slide, there's a diagram that shows what the gill nets actually look like. So on either side, you can see that there is a flag with a buoy. Um, and then as you work your way in, there are two set, there's a set of anchors, one on each side, holds the gill net in place in the river. In from that are another set of buoys. And then in between that is the active fishing net. So the net is 300 feet long, but is comprised of 10 separate sections, each of them being 30 feet long, 10 feet wide, and they are composed of different mesh sizes. So the picture on the top actually shows what the net looks like, say if you're on a boat driving by, so you can see the two flags on either end, um, the buoys towards as you work your way in, and then in between those two buoys is the active net in the um, river. Electrofishing is a bit different. So electrofishing tagging is primarily conducted in the James and Rappahannock rivers, but there is supplemental um, surveying done on other Chesapeake um, tributaries, including the Mattapanai. Stunfish are brought on board, tagged, assessed for disease, revived in a stock tank, and then released back into the river. The picture on top actually shows the VIMS electrofishing boat. So behind the captain, there's a generator that is um, creating the electricity used for electrofishing. The bow of the boat, there are two surveyors holding nets to collect the stunned fish. Held out in front of them on poles are the anoids that actually introduce the electricity into the water. The electricity stuns the fish. They are netted by the crew, brought onto the boat. To the right of the text is one of the surveyors, Lydia, actually tagging one of the striped bass on a measuring board. Once that fish seems to be back to a normal state, it is reintroduced back into the river with its newly acquired tag. So now to get into some results, um, I've had two, uh, two, two surveying seasons since I've started my master's. The 2020 sampling season collected 2,106 individuals through electrofishing gillnet combined with 38.8% of fish exhibiting skin lesions while the 2021 sampling season collected 2,176 individuals with 39.7% of fish exhibiting skin lesions. Very similar sample sizes, very similar disease prevalence being seen. I do wanna say though that this is exclusively skin lesion data so far. This does not include fish that may have internal granulomas present but are not exhibiting that skin lesion aspect. So I've had about a year to play around with the 2020 data set um, in R doing statistical models, um, making graphs, but I have yet to get the um, 2021 sampling season master data set. The surveying just completed about four days ago. So I will get to that sometime this summer, but I do have two graphs that show the gill net and uh, electrofishing age versus prevalence for the 2020 sampling season. So on the first one, the gillnet one that's on the screen right now has the James and Rappahannock rivers, James and pink, Rappahannock and blue. And between the ages of two and five on the bottom axis, you can clearly see an increase in, in uh, disease prevalence for both of these rivers as age increases. Once you hit age six, you see a decrease in prevalence in the James River, but a slight increase, if not just about the same for the Rappahannock, at age seven and eight, you see 100% disease prevalence. That is due to low sample size. The same with zero disease prevalence seen in the James at um, age eight, also due to low sample size. But for age seven at the Rappahannock, you still see a disease prevalence somewhere around 45%. So this is the second graph showing electrofishing age versus prevalence with the Mattapanai out now introduced. Uh, the Mattapanai is in the green. We're going to jump over to age three, where we have the first three data sets. 
Uh, we see a disease prevalence between 25 and 35 percent. As we go to age four, we lose the metapanai. We see it again at age five and age seven. But from age four to age seven, we see a clear increase again in disease prevalence from the James and Rappahannock rivers. And then at between age five and age seven, where we do have metapanai data, again, we see a clear increase in disease prevalence. So to end the presentation, I'm just going to kind of point out some reasons why um, the work that I'm doing does have some sort of importance to the Bay ecosystem and to striped bass health overall. So microbacteriosis, it affects fish populations, meaning it could affect recreational and commercially uh, fisheries within the Bay. Um, it could have effect on livelihoods of baymen and it could severely impact a very important um, recreationally targeted fish in the Bay and along the entire Atlantic coast. And even though diseased fish can live with this infection, like I mentioned before, it usually always progresses forward. It is important for uh, scientists to start estimating the disease prevalence within different parts of the striper population. Since high prevalence may ultimately lead to higher natural mortality, accurate prevalence data should be estimated for accurate stock assessments uh, currently done by Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Currently, microbacteriosis is treated as part of an overall natural mortality within stock assessments done, but how much of the natural mortality is affected um, by disease is not currently estimated, and that can only be done with current um, high quality mycobacteriosis prevalence data. So at this time, I do want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank VIMS for allowing me to present here today and for allowing me to collect my data off of one of their very important surveys. And lastly, I'd like to thank my main advisor, Dr. David Godier at Old Dominion University. Um, we're going to move on to the question section now. If we do not get to your question at this time, please feel free to email me or Jameson at our appropriate emails. I'm going to keep the slide up until the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. That was great. So uh, we can go ahead and get started with the Q&A if you guys are ready. Um, the first question is from Imani. Can you tell us more about the origin of mycobacteriosis? So the origin of the species itself, I don't really know where it's coming from in the bay. Um, it has yet to be determined. Mycobacteriosis in fish um, to begin with dates back around the 1890s, I believe, where carp actually were becoming infected in a pond near a TB clinic. Um, tuberculosis is in the same family as the mycobacteriosis species that I study. And the first documented cases of fish getting it, I believe, were the carp near this um, tuberculosis patient center. Very interesting. Um, we do have another question from John. Is it dangerous to eat a diseased fish? So I actually get this one a lot. I'm a recreational fisherman myself, and now all my friends ask me. The answer um, shortly is no, you can eat diseased fish. There is a danger though. Um, you never know what species of myco the fish that you may be handling has. So my best advice for anyone that is handling a diseased fish is to thoroughly wash your hands every time that you handle that fish. Even if you're just returning it to the water, thoroughly clean your hands with something. If you take it home, make sure you clean your hands after filleting it and then cleaning the um, area that it was laying on. Um, Mycobacterium shotsii and pseudoshotsii have not shown a zoonotic um, jump to humans, but emmerinum, which is one of the most prevalent mycobacteria species in all um, fin fish, can actually jump and cause a rather nasty infection in um, humans. Say if you were filleting a fish that had a ulcer caused by emmerinum, it could enter a cut. So I do tell most people to thoroughly wash your hands every time you do handle a fish that you do believe is um, diseased. Um, I do have a question from Sally. You mentioned that it's likely present in all or other fish. Why does it seem to affect striped bass so much more than other fish species? Or is that not the case? Does it not affect other fishes? Does it affect other fishes? So it likely does impact um, if not all, almost all fin fish species. Um, that's one of the very peculiar things about striped bass is it showing very high disease prevalence. Um, there has been little published data 
outside the Chesapeake Bay, um, but disease has been shown in um, the Delaware and there has been like anecdotal fishing um, pictures along the entire coast of striped bass showing microbacteriosis. They're not really sure why we're seeing very high disease prevalence in this wild stock. It is kind of an outlier. In aquaculture, it is um, somewhat a regular occurrence and can actually cause huge financial burdens to aquaculture facilities as it spreads throughout. And then it's a rather hard um, species to deal with. Um, so usually fish are kind of cold and then entire setups are thoroughly cleaned. I think we've got time for one last question here from Cassandra. Um, is there any difference in how the sex of the fish, does that affect how susceptible it is? I'm gonna be looking at that um, as my data sets kind of build and build. So I have the 2021 data set and I plan to do one more year of surveying. So that is a question um, that I am gonna be asking myself um, with my female amount of data from 2020 was rather low. So all the graphs that I showed are exclusively male, but in one of those previous studies, the one that was looking at um, internal granuloma presence, there was a drop in disease prevalence between ages or after age six for females. And it's believed that that might actually be due to disease associated mortality. Um, after the age of five or six, males were reaching disease prevalence between about 70 and 90, so very high disease prevalence, while there was a steep drop off in female. Um, so it's thought that there may be some sort of um, difference between sex. That is going to be one thing that I am going to explore. Hopefully, if I am able to present again next year, I'd be able to talk about that a little bit more. Great. I think we've got time to sneak in one more question before we wrap up. Um, is there any way to contain the disease or to cure it? So there it currently is no um, cure for mycobacteriosis, any species in um, fish. Even with tuberculosis in um, human patients, it is a rather long and strenuous um, process. It takes, I believe, about six months to help a TB patient. So there is nothing right now for um, striped bass or any fin fish. Um, in wild populations, it's gonna be very hard to control. Um, it just seems like it is spreading more than it's being contained. And I have not heard um, yet of a practical containment method. And again, even in aquaculture, very hard to contain. Usually the best method is to cull the entire stock, thoroughly clean um, pens, raceways, whatever they may be held in, um, and then kind of starting over. Aquarists, um, people that do it as a hobby, they can have a mycospecific tank. I have heard of that. Like if say, if they have a fish that they particularly like, it does become susceptible and become infected with myco. Um, you can hold them, they can live. Um, I guess that's one plus, at least with myco is it does not kill them instantly, but it does seem like these fish do just progress in the wrong direction uh, to more severe states. Awesome. Uh, it looks like our time's uh, just about over. Uh, Jameson and Joshua, thank you guys so much for being here and for helping us learn more about your research. Um, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us.